Welcome back. Given the parabolic state of markets lately and the very big economic calendar next week, thought it might be helpful uh, to reassess where we are in terms of stocks and also U.S. Treasuries so that when we see the market react to the calendar next week with GDP, uh, durable goods, we have a Fed meeting, we have inflationary numbers, wholesale inventories, housing numbers, uh, we can have a better idea about how to anticipate market movements and to interpret how the market is behaving as a result of these numbers. So the blue line here is the S&P 500. We closed in the lower half of the week or the week's training range, so to speak. The red line is a low of the week. The green line is a high. We closed S&P 500 around 4536. It's important to note where the market closes at the end of the week because that really does define or help to define the trend. Here we see the yellow dots that represents the closing price of every day. Notice, and the red line again is a low of the week, the blue line is a high of each respective week. Notice how narrow the trading range is. During uptrending markets, we tend to see narrow ranges. These ranges will widen as volatility widens, and when volatility increases, sometimes that's a sign of a reversal. Uh, small trading ranges are a sign of complacency, but I think it's a little dangerous when everybody agrees on the direction because then big moves in the opposite direction can take place. Uh, also, take a look at the S&P 500 in terms of its own respective 52 52-week range. Every red dot represents one stock in the S&P 500. On a scale of 0 to 100, now if the stock, if we see a dot near 100%, it means that stock's at its yearly high. If it's at the bottom, yearly low. Notice the big cluster of stocks near, and we're going to see another chart how, how dramatic really this is. A big cluster of these red dots are in the 80, 90 percentile. Much, uh, relatively speaking, much fewer stocks are near the lower end of the range. There's a lot more open space down here. This is how it looks numerically. Every histogram represents the number of stocks in every particular percentile uh, bracket in terms of their own 52 week range. So, for example, this highest histogram bar here that shows us there are 56 stocks out of the SP 500, 56 stocks that have that are closing price today in the 90 to 95 percentile of their 52-week ranges, which means if you go back one year, 56 of those stocks are within 10 percentage points of their all-time, or not all-time, but their yearly high. We have uh, 47 stocks in the 95 to 100 percentile. We have 44 stocks in the 85 to 90 percentile. So you take all these, to, you know, you put all these together, we have a very large amount of the stock market that's trading near its 52 week high. Very few stocks, relatively speaking, are near their 52 week lows. Uh, in terms of industries, these are the top 10 industries represented within the S&P 500. Uh, and each industry is shown with its own respective relative strength, RSI. Other consumer services, that's number one, oil field services is number two, oil and gas transmission. Seems like oil is very strong lately, at least as far as the sector is concerned. After that, biotechnology, paints and coatings, steel and iron, more biotech. Now, take a look at the bottom sectors. The bottom sectors include minerals. That's not really a big surprise. Metals, you know, have really been kind of lagging the way despite Oddly, despite uh, a weak dollar, precious metals is also near the lower end of the range. Uh, meat and poultry, specialty foods, professional services. There's not really a clear, you know, takeaway from this. I mean, metals are weak and oils are strong, uh, but I don't know that there's a lot to discern out of this. If we saw, you know, a lot of one sector represented in the top or the bottom 10 industries, I think that would be a different uh, situation. But here we have a mixture of precious metals, broadcasting, foods. Uh, now here is the Friday close as a percentage of the week. What we want to make note of is where the market closed in respect to its own weekly range. What was a low and what was a high between Monday and Friday? Well, we see 
Today, we closed at 45.36 S&P 500. That's the red line. That close represents a 32% level of the week, which means uh, imagine the week was 0 to 100. We closed today at 32. In the bottom third of the week, that's not really a good sign. You want to see the market close near the high. Uptrending markets are defined by those markets that open near the low of the week on Monday and close near the high of the week on Friday. Conversely, downtrending markets are defined when we open, when Monday is kind of like the high of the week and Friday we're closer to the low. Look at the prior weeks, especially when the S&P 500 moved from 4,100 up to 44, 300 points in the S&P 500 in about four weeks. We'll notice how the market closed, 93 percentile, 100 percentile, 100, 100. These four weeks, the market was very strong, closed near the highs on Friday. Today's close is the first, really not such a good close. Uh, maybe this on its own doesn't mean much, but you know, let's let's keep this in mind because there's other things out there. This is the S and P 500 scatter chart in terms of the RSI. Every yellow dot represents one stock in the S and P 500, and it's displayed by their own. Uh, respective RSI relative strength index readings, uh, meaning it's indications above 70 are considered overbought, below 30 oversold. It's actually only one stock with an RSI uh, below below 30. And between 50 and 30, which is considered weak territory, it's a very lonely area down here. Not a lot of stocks are between 30 to 50, which indicates a, a, a somewhat strong trend to the downside. Between 50 and 70 represents the vast majority of the stocks. The vast majority of the S&P 500 is in a healthy trend to the upside. If we're looking at a particular stock and it doesn't seem to be doing well, that is not the, the usual. That's the exception to the rule. Here is the RSI in terms of count. There are 114 stocks in the S&P 500 with an RSI between 60 to 65. Another 82 between 65 to 70. The vast majority of the S&P 500 is between, again, it's a different way to look at it. Same information though. 50 to 70, that is the vast majority. It's showing us that the majority of the stock market is in a strong, healthy trend to the upside. Now, let's get to the bond markets because the stock market looks strong. I think it's a little bit too complacent. Uh, that we shouldn't be so comfortable, that amount of complacency, that amount of agreement. You know, when everybody buys stocks, all we have are a room full of potential sellers. Doesn't mean the market's going to go down tomorrow, but it is cause for concern. Now, this is how the bond market looks. This is a change for today in terms of basis points. Really very quiet bond market lately. It's waiting for the Fed meeting next week. Two basis points of the upside in the two-year one basis point to the downside in the seven year, and all other uh, maturities are in a very similar, very quiet uh, fashion. This is where U.S. current uh, treasuries currently stand. The highest yields are divided almost equally among the short term, the one month treasury note through the one year treasury bond, 543, 554, etc. Now, we go on to the longer term, the longer end of the maturity scale, and we have a 10-year bond at the lowest at 384. We have between 384 and let's say uh, the one month bond at a 543, you have 159, 160 basis points, if my math is correct, overall 150% or 1.5% difference. That's how much the bond market's inverted. An inverted bond market occurs when the short-term maturities pay a higher yield than the long-term maturities. It's not a condition that normally happens. We've spoken about this quite a bit in the past, not lately, which we should, uh, but it's an unusual situation. It's not that every inverted bond market absolutely predicts a recession, but every recession has been predated by an inverted bond market uh, condition. It doesn't happen immediately. Uh, we'll have, we're going to have to go through it and audit the numbers carefully, but I believe it's on a year's lag, maybe one to 18 months, 
one year to 18 months lag between the inverted bond market, which by the way started June of last year. We're about 14, 13, 14 months into the inversion now. Uh, we're going to have to take a look at those numbers carefully. This is how the bond market has changed in terms of yield over the past month, 30 calendar days. The one-month bond has gone up. This is where the money flows. One-month bond is up five percentage points. Now, again, yield goes up. It means the bond price is actually going down. If you have a $1,000 bond and the yield goes up, that $1,000 bond is actually worth a little bit less, let's say $950. So, when yield goes, it means money's moving out of the short-term bonds. There's a couple different reasons why this could take place, but I think it's most important to recognize where the money is moving in the bond market. All yields across the board are going up, by the way, which is unusual if we uh, compare that to what we saw a couple months ago when the short-term, I'm sorry, the long-term yields, the seven, ten-year yields were going down, they were negative. Not the case now. All yields are going up. But the short-term bonds is where the yield is going up the most. And the reason I believe that's happening is because there's an anticipation of higher interest rates. Next meeting, there's, I believe, around a 96% chance that the Federal Reserve will raise rates. Uh, and then the meeting after that, there's speculation they'll do so again. Uh, but that's the short-term bonds. So long-term bonds tell us more a story about the perception the bond market's idea about our long-term ec uh, economic condition, our long-term uh, prospects in terms of uh, the economy, not so rosy. That's the definition. That's why an inverted bond market occurs, because the bond market is telling us we expect short, uh, higher rates in the short term, but in the long term, things don't look so good. This is what this month in bonds looks like. Uh, the... Let's see here. The one-year bond is the dotted purple line over here. We had a little bit of a blip, but it's holding very steady. The one-month bond, that's probably the biggest move over here, that move up in the one-month bond. So we have here from the top to bottom, we have the four-month. That's the red line. The dotted yellow line is a six-month. The white line, dotted white line, is a two-month. The purple is a three. The dotted black line is a one-month. And uh, the dotted purple line here is a one-year short term across the board. Below that, uh, we have the two-year, and then we go to the three-year. The green line is a 20-year, all the way to the bottom. That's the 10-year. The blue area chart in the background is the S&P 500. Now, stocks are going up. Well, we could spend a lot of time speculating why all this is happening together. But the fact of the matter is, is that the short-term yields are going up more than the long-term yields while the stock market's going up. The stock market, I think, is looking at the Federal Reserve. It's looking at the economic numbers, and it's saying, hey, look, the Federal Reserve is raising rates, but the economy still looks good. The anticipation of higher corporate profits still look good, and stocks move up in anticipation of higher corporate profits. Uh, now, the short-term yields are telling us, yeah, the Federal Reserve is going to raise rates, but the long-term yields are arguing. So the stock market is really agreeing with the short-term yields. Stock market, if the stock market agreed with a 30-year bond, stocks would be very weak right now because a 30-year bond is not so strong in terms of yield. Stocks are agreeing with short-term. This is uh, the red. Uh, the red line is a one-year bond. The black line is a one-month bond. The purple line is the ten-year bond. Notice the spread between the two. That's the inversion. Now, what's important about this chart? And by the way, that's the S&P 500 in the background. Go back to May. Black line, one-month bond. That's one-month Treasury note. Actually, it skyrocketed. Hit 602 on the yield. May 26. Now, where the shortest term bond, or in this case, note goes, the less shorter term maturity usually follows. When the black line goes up, the red line usually follows. But the black line, the uh, one month bond, I think it, you know, the one month note, it got disjointed. We got a little ahead of ourselves and we came back to a period of normalcy. And that's why we see a little bit of a spread here. Now, of course, it's not an accident. There's trillions of dollars that go through these financial markets. But this really was, if we look back at the economic calendar, this took place when there was, I believe at the time, that perception that the Fed was not going to raise rates. 
And then we got some economic numbers, and all of a sudden the rates looked a lot better. That's what changed. And when rates looked a lot better, you'll notice that's when the stock market really started to climb. We're kind of in the trading range over here. Last week, actually, we had a video. We're going we're gonna to revisit this again next week before the Fed meeting. But we had a video last week taking a look at the probabilities, how they're assigned by the futures market in terms of you know, how the Federal Reserve will, if they're going to raise rates. And we spoke about this last week. We'll do it. We'll talk about it again next week, how the stock market really exploded, moved a lot higher when the odds shifted from, well, we're not going to raise rates to, yes, we are going to raise rates in July. That shift that occurred coincides with this one-month bond exploding the way it did. Historically, take a look back at 2007. We had a really strong bond market at the time, the one-month bond. That was a one-month note. That's the black line. We had an inverted bond market. The one-month was above the one-year. The one-year was above the 10-year. That was the S&P 500. Notice when the stock market eventually crumbled, what really went down? The one month. We watched a one month treasury note because that really is a very sensitive indicator to a shift in policy, a shift in perception of Federal Reserve and interest rates and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to watch one goal next week is to watch the one month treasury notes. Here's the one year in red versus a 10 year in uh, blue. The histogram bars at the bottom show us to the extent of the inversion. Right now, we have a 151 basis point inversion. That's a lowest low. And by the way, the inversion that took place in the year 2000, do we have it here? Yes, was only 50 basis points. We're at 150. We have a three times, the inversion right now is three times as much as it was in 2000, in the year 2000. In 2007, the inverted bond market was also a negative 50 basis points. And eventually we know what happened. The one year crumbled. We don't have the one month here, but it certainly did crumble as well and fell back below the 10 year. And that's really what we want to watch moving forward is does the one year, does a short term maturity cross up above the 10 year to end the inversion? Or does a 10 cross below? Or I should say, does a one cross below the 10 or the 10 cross up? over the one. If the 10 strengthens in terms of yield, that indicates economic prosperity in the future. If the one year, the short-term maturity falls down like it did in the year 2007, 2008, and in the year 2000, notice the red line crosses down. Notice here, the red line crosses down. That was the beginning of the catastrophe in terms of the stock market. Here's a 10 versus two year present day. A uh, very similar pattern, the two years, obviously, a little bit closer to the 10, so it's less reactive, but uh, we still see a very big inversion here, you know, uh, almost 1%, I think, at this point. So, point being is that we have, oh, that's actually really, really neat. Let's take a look at also the rate of change. This is the rate of change in the year 2000. How much are the bonds moving? The red line's a 10-year, and the red area chart over here shows us where if the 10-year is moving faster than the one-year. Right now, the one-year is going down. Well, that's, I'm sorry, this was the year 2000. That's when the market crumbled. That's actually 202. Notice when the stock market really started to crumble, that's when the one-year collapses. Blue area chart over here shows a collapse of the one-year. This is where we are now. The one year is a red line. The black line is a 10 year and very little movement. We want to see after all those numbers are released next week, what really moves. Does the one year move up or down, I should say? Does the 10 year move up? Where is the money really flowing? Uh, so we again, we have a big calendar next week. Durable goods, GDP, Federal Reserve, inflation. Uh, we want to watch to see, let's go back to this chart. What does a one month do? 
the one month is really going to be the canary in the cold mine, so to speak. If the one month really starts to go down, the one month treasury note, that could mean that all these numbers and the bond markets and uh, interpretation of the numbers, that the Federal Reserve is closer to the end of tightening. Conversely, if we see the the 10 year, the purple line move up and yield, well, maybe that means that the Federal Reserve is more likely to raise rates even further down the road. The stock market is going to react based on the anticipation of higher, lower corporate, corporate earnings. I think there's a little bit of a buffer in, in that respect, a little bit of a, a delay. Uh, so we have some time in terms of the stock market. But again, going back to the stock market, it's been very strong. We have relative strength indications near or above 70. But we didn't have a good close today. We did not have a good close this week. It closed in a lower third of the week's trading range, which, again, in and of itself, it's not a big deal. But given we're at such a parabolic state, historically speaking, the last couple of videos we've been talking a lot about the stock market, um, it's important to note when the market starts to look a little soft. One soft close doesn't mean the end of a rally, but it's just one little extra nugget of information in our arsenal. We hope this has been helpful. We look forward to seeing you back soon.